Hey everybody, welcome to Church Online. My name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here at Hermantown Community Church. And we're so glad you're joining us from wherever it is that you're watching. We want to let you know that this is a place here at Hermantown Community Church where you belong no matter what you are facing. And we would love to get you connected and everything happening here at the church. The easiest way to do that is to head over to our website, hermantownchurch.com. Or you can jump on one of our many social media platforms at Hermantown CC. At any social media platform, Hermantown CC. There you'll be able to get connected to everything we have going on and stay up to date on all the events and services that we have happening. And speaking of services, I know you're enjoying this experience online, but we want you to know that we are having live and in-person services right here in our own building every Sunday at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. So whether you experience it here in the building or right here online, we're so glad you're going to be joining us. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for all of you who continue to support what we're doing as a church. Because of your generosity and because of your faithfulness, your financial gifts have been able to help us continue doing what we do as a church as well as meet the needs of people here in our church family, our community, and all the missionaries we work with overseas around the world. It doesn't happen without you. Every gift is significant. Everything that you do matters. So we just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. You can continue to give by heading over to hermantownchurch.com slash give. It's super easy, safe, and secure to set up. All the instructions are right there for you to set up a one-time gift or you can set up like a reoccurring scheduled gift right there on our page. Well, listen, we're excited about the experience. Sit back, relax, and let's worship together. Yeah. 
Father, we thank you for our newness in you today, God. The old life is gone and the new has come. Just allow these words just to walk through your homes and over your families here today as you're watching church online. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom till I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my doom that I may see you call my name.
when you say that, God, that that is a promise, Jesus. And all of your promises are yes and amen. So, Father, here today, God, we open up our hearts, God. We just allow you to come into our homes, God.
Father, may we become a people that chooses to praise you, that chooses to glorify your name in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the quarantine. Father, may we be a people that chooses to praise. Father, may we prioritize our choice. nobody else knew about us. There's this group of people in the Bible called the Hebrew people, the Israelites. And God actually talks to them about this very thing, about remembering. Now to give you a bit of their life history, which you can read about in the Bible's Old Testament book of Genesis and Exodus, really the whole thing, but that's the start of the whole story of their lives. This group of people, this people group had been enslaved to like a military and economic superpower in Egypt. These Hebrew people were treated like animals, like less than human, and they were slaves, sold into slavery, families grew up as slaves, and generation after generation. Now, there was a rumor going around, though, that one day their God, the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, was going to deliver them from their, what they called their bondage, their slavery. And I wasn't there, but I'm assuming just like those family reunions or times where you and your loved ones or family, they get together and they reminisce and they tell stories, I'm sure that they had stories that they were sharing their stories weren't as good. Maybe some good memories, but as long as they can remember, for hundreds of years, this people group had been enslaved. And I can imagine sitting around the dinner table or maybe even by a campfire sharing, hey, it's right around the corner, guys. God is going to deliver us. It's right there. I can feel it. It'll probably happen in my lifetime. And then it didn't. And the kids would... would grow up as slaves and have that same uh, conversation with their kids that, hey, one day, and it could be today. What, what, what if? What if it was today that God delivers us? And then, which can only be described as a miracle, God delivers this group of people from slavery. Through a series of miracles, many of which are told in churches and on movies all over, plagues that came and this Red Sea that split so that they could get away from these people who freed them. The, the, the Pharaoh had said, finally, you go. Just get out of here. God had done so much crazy stuff. You just get out of here. They changed their mind. Now they're back chasing them. The Red Sea splits and they go through and now they're free. They're free and they wander in the wilderness for about 40 years. And time after time, God shows how good he is to this group of people. They're starving, so God, they wake up and there's bread all over the ground. 
They're die, literally dying of thirst. And so God gives them water from a rock time and time again. They face a battle. They were far outnumbered, and God gives them a victory time and time again. God does these amazing things in their lives, and then God says something to them that seems so unnecessary to say. It almost feels like it doesn't fit the story. And it's recorded in the Bible's Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a super interesting book. If you ever have some free time, you just want to read a very interesting book. Deuteronomy is this very interesting book in the Bible's Old Testament, one of the original five books of the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, here's what God tells them. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. What a weird thing to have to tell a group of people who just got delivered from slavery. How could you ever forget that? How could that ever slip your mind? Oh, yeah. Remember those hundreds of years we were in slavery? Totally forgot about that, you know. It seems so weird. It seems like it doesn't belong. Because they were headed, they weren't there yet, but they were headed to this land that God had promised. So not only had he delivered them from slavery, and not only had he performed miracle after miracle to keep this people group alive, he had promised them their own place. Because they were a people with no land. They were nomads, traveling and wandering, and they finally end up in Canaan. And it was a place that, you know, greater than they had ever imagined. They had to fight to get there, but they got there. But years before, he's, God says, but don't forget. When you get there, and slavery is a thing of the past, or starving is a thing of the past, or you can't remember the last time you were thirsty, don't forget. Never forget it was God that rescued. It almost seems absurd. It almost seems absurd to even have to say it, for God to even have to say it, yet he says it. And then the, the story goes, old Moses is the guy that God chooses to lead these people out of slavery. Well, Moses led him through wandering all over the place, a great leader, talked with God. He would then take that message and give it to the people, but then Moses dies. And God chooses Joshua then to step up and lead. And it was actually Joshua who led the people into the promised land. And there were leaders that Joshua had with him. And, but these people were so devoted to God. In fact, here's what the book of Judges, another Old Testament book says in the second chapter. And the Israelites, these Hebrew people, served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived them, they were so devoted to God. God, look what you did for us. How could they not be devoted? Miracle after miracle after miracle. How could they not be devoted? It says, those, they were devoted, um, I'll, I'll, read, I'll start over. And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders that outlived him. And those who have seen all great things the Lord had done for Israel. And then a couple verses later, in verse 10, it says this. Another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. All those years earlier, God is telling them, don't forget. Of course we won't forget God. How could we forget? Years later, they're still worshiping. They're still honoring God. Because slavery and hunger and thirsty is not that far in the rearview mirror. It's almost like they can still remember the feeling of the taskmaster's whip on their back. They have the scars to show it. Of course, God, I'm so grateful. They set up annual feasts to commemorate what God had done, we will never forget. Let us never forget. And then time got further and further away. And pretty soon, now there's a whole new generation that forgot the mighty works of God. Which I think is the most ridiculous thing that could ever happen until I pause for just a moment and evaluate my own life. Because I'm just going to tell you, I've got a list of things on how good God has been to me. A list, right? 
And I could go back, if we were to have coffee together, I could probably sit for hours and just tell you the things that I remember. Not to mention the things that I have forgotten or didn't even realize that God had saved me from. That Because I didn't do it, I didn't realize it was God. I was just going this way. and God had directed me that way. And danger was for me over here, but God pushed me a different direction. I didn't even realize it was him. The calamity that I could have fell into if it wasn't for God's saving power, those things I couldn't even tell you about, things that I have forgotten. But just the things I could remember, I could give you a list of things. And to be honest with you, there are some things that God has done in my life that I completely forgot. I, I can imagine there were things in high school, things that I prayed for that God delivered on, and I can't even remember that it happened. Because there's been so much that's happened in my life since then. <clears throat> And I just haven't taken time to remember, to think about, to meditate on how good God has been to me. I'm just going to ask a really elementary school question here. Has God been good to you? I just want you to think about it. I think for some of us, our gut reaction is to say, yes, yeah, he's been good to me. Okay, specifically, think about it for a second. Think of something recently that you can say, God has been good to me. Just one thing. Maybe a couple things pop into your mind right away. And for some of us, maybe that isn't our gut reaction. If you knew, I know some of us are thinking, man, if you knew what was going on in my life right now, I can't say with my whole heart that God is good. And I have been in moments in my life where I have, knowing all that God has done for me over the years, in my 41 years on the earth, but I'm in the middle of some chaos in one moment in my life, and I think to myself, God, where in the world are you? What's up with this? You bail on me now? Forgetting that God has never let me down. It's interesting how easily we forget. It's interesting how good God is and that he was smart enough to remind them, but or to tell them, I should say, before they ever even forgot, hey, be careful. Don't forget. Don't forget, God, we would not forget. Don't forget, Lord, we won't forget. Lord, where are you? It's not that far of a move in life. And the reason it's not that far of a move, and the reason I can honestly tell you that it's happened so many times in my life, is because if you're anything like me, here's what happens to me. God does something, whatever it is, and I can get so self-absorbed into what's going on right now that everything that God has done no longer remains at the forefront of my mind. It's back there somewhere, but it's way back there, you know? Way back there. And whatever's going on is now the predominant, dominant thought of my life. And then, here's what I catch myself doing. This is the rhythm that I get into, which is interesting because it's the rhythm that these sa the same group of people got into. God will do something incredible. Maybe I pray, or maybe I didn't even pray, but just something amazing happens. God does something. He blesses us in a way that we didn't expect, or we prayed for God to come through, and then God comes through, and then the prayer gets answered, and I am thanking God, our families together, thanking God it's so good, and then something bad happens, and the first thing out of my mouth, if I'm just being honest, is a complaint about something. A complaint about something. A complaint on how bad things are. Or I compare my life to somebody else's and say, yeah, God's been good, but man, he's been really good to them. Why can't, Lord, you know? And so my gratefulness will quickly turn into complaining. I'm not even complaining about God. I'm just complaining about whatever is going on in my life. And pretty soon that amazing thing God did is somewhere sort of in a memory bank that I have to force to recall when I'm in conversation with somebody or thinking about it or maybe something happens that reminds me instead of me just rehearsing how good God has been in my life. He said, never forget. When things are good, and when you're not hungry anymore, and when you're not thirsty anymore, and when there's not a taskmaster driving at you, don't forget that I'm good. Don't forget that it was me. He reminds us because we are so quick to forget. And not only are we quick to forget, but we are quick to jump on the other side of this thing, and then we start living 
in the world of complaints about what's going on in the world or what's going on in our own world. And, and over these last five months, as a pastor, it's been very interesting, the conversations that I've engaged in. They've been really, really good. But the conversations have been interesting because I'll talk to people, a lot of times even from the same family, but definitely under the banner of Christ, that have such differing thoughts and opinions on what's going on in the world around us. And I'll just be honest with you. This is not a, um, a statement against. This is just an observation of. Over the last five months, during what has become a very chaotic time in our world, not just, hey, listen, not only in our state, we're not just talking about our state here or our city. We're talking about this is a chaotic time in the world, right? With virus, conversation about that, with racial conversation and tension and conversation about that. It's been a worldwide conversation. Not just a city-wide, not just a church-wide, not just a you-wide conversation. It's been a worldwide conversation. And in my life, I have never engaged in more conversations where the dominant theme was complaining. Probably never in my whole life. Especially as a, as a pastor in conversation, never have I engaged in more conversations where the dominant theme of the conversations have been complaining about something. Complaining. Who has the right to do this and who doesn't? What's been right? What's wrong? What needs to change? How I'm right and they're wrong? How, you know what I mean? They're wrong and I'm right. It's been a constant, constant, constant complaining. And I'm going to be super honest with you. I've got sucked into it at times. I walk away with my head shaking. Yeah, those suckers, man. I'm telling you. And it doesn't even matter what the conversation has been about. But it's shifted towards somebody's wrong. Somebody's at fault. Someone's infringing on my rights. Somebody's doing something wrong to me. And I'm not going to stand for it anymore. And then the, just the venom that's flying out of people's mouths has been so interesting to me. Here's what it's caused me to do. Now, I don't know all of you all super well, so this is not an indictment on any person in this room. I'm just telling you the conversations that I've had. What has been most interesting to me, I think, is how quickly, how quickly I have gotten sucked into it. I don't even share the same opinions as some people I'm talking to, and I leave the conversation in a funk. Yeah, man. I'm with you, man. What article did you read? I'm going to read that too, you know. Can I just tell you something about my life? I'm 41 years old. I grew up in, um, compared to a lot of people, not a very dysfunctional family, but for us it was kind of dysfunctional. And God transformed my life at a fairly young age. I was in high school. And um, I've been super fortunate. I feel super blessed. I'm married. I've got a great family. I've got 41 years of a list of things that I am grateful for. God has been so good to me and has blessed me. I've got enough blessings in my life to say thank you for that another complaint should never slip out of my mouth again. God has been so good to me. I have no right, personally, have no right to complain about another thing for the rest of my life. That's how good God's been to me. And if you're sitting there hard-pressed, thinking about, man, doesn't sound like my life. I can't think of something. Can I, can I just give you one thought today, how God's been good to you? You've got breath in your lungs, and you're sitting here today. We took communion just not long ago. And I, I made a statement out of God's word that God has forgiven our sins, past, 
present and future, and he's not holding your wrong against you. Can I just give you a heads up? If God did nothing else for us, the rest of our lives, we have nothing to complain about. We've been forgiven. We've been forgiven. We could say thank you for that every day for the rest of our lives and never complain about another thing, but that's not the only thing God has done for you. And I don't know your life, and I don't know what your list would be. Your list of things you're grateful for will look different than the list of things that I'm grateful for. You have walked through things that I have not walked that I have not walked through. God has brought you through things he hasn't brought me through, but God has brought me through some stuff, and he has blessed me in certain ways, and I can remember vividly some of those things in my life. What right? How dare I stand and complaining about the world that we live in when God has been so good to me? Can I just give you a word of encouragement? Don't get sucked into that world. Live grateful. Live grateful. No one really wants to hear it anyways, to be honest. They want you to hear their complaints, and you want them to hear your complaints, but you really don't want to hear each other's complaints. But we do it. We do it, and we're firm about it, and we believe we're right. And so we continue to do it. I continue to do it. And over the last several weeks... To be honest, one of the reasons why I realized it is because I was getting sucked into it. I'm thankful I realized it. I was getting sucked right into the whole thing. Having conversations about stuff I don't even care about, but all of a sudden I care about it. <laughs> just getting sucked in. And so let me make a little disclaimer about what I just said. I am not suggesting you should vote or uh, think a certain way about anything. That is not what I'm trying to push out. This is not a place of politics. You're never going to hear me preach about politics, push one way or another. What I will say is that this is a place of hope where we lift up the name of Jesus. Yes? This is a place of encouragement. All that stuff, you guys can talk about that somewhere else. So I'm not trying to push one way or another. I'm just saying don't get sucked in to the life of complaining. It makes you look ungrateful for all God has done. And I know it's made me forget how good God is at times. There's this great line in the, in the book of Psalms. It's, I could read the whole chapter. We're not going to take time to read the whole chapter, but I could read the whole chapter. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back out. Psalms 103. Oh, man, it's so good I could read the whole thing, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. Should I? No. How about this? You read the whole thing. Psalms 103. There's 150. It's the longest book in all the Bible. This is the 103rd of 150 Psalms, most of which, not all, but most of which was written by David, one of the kings of Israel, one of the kings of the people group that had been released from slavery. And he writes this beautiful song. I'm, don't get excited. I'm not going to sing it for you anything, but I'm just going to read you the lyrics to this psalm, this song. It says, Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. Here's what I love about this first line. He doesn't say when things are good. He doesn't say if I feel like it. He doesn't say if I'm in church, I've got a band. He just says, let all that I am praise or with my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. He says it again, let all that I am praise the Lord. I love this part. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. Has God done anything good in your life? May we never forget forget it. He says here again, he forgives all my sins, past, present, and future. Can I just tell you something? I realize that there are people here today that have a hard um, time with that concept. No matter what you've done, God has forgiven you. There is nothing you could ever do to make God love you less. Impossible. I don't care how bad your past, your present, or your future is. There is nothing you could ever do to make God love you less. You may not have forgiven yourself, 
And others may not have forgiven you for what you've done, but God holds your sin not against you. He does not hold your sin against you. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my disease. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. The Lord is compassionate. I don't know what your view of God is today, but let me just give you a real view of who God is. The Lord is compassionate. He is merciful. He's slow to get angry. He's filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us or remain angry with us forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He doesn't deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is great as the heights of the heavens above the earth. He's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate, tender and compassionate. I don't know if your view of God is angry and upset, but he is tender and compassionate. The Lord is like a father is to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers we're only dust. Verse 17, but the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children. God is good. <laughs> he is good. And I get that sometimes life stinks. And I get, I get that we get frustrated and we have opinions. And we want to just let our voice be heard. We want to stand up against things. We want to stand for what's right or at least for what we think is right. That's fine. But don't get sucked into forgetting how good it is by living a life of complaining. What a waste of breath. What a waste of your life complaining. You never get those seconds back. Don't waste your life complaining about what should be. Thank God for what is and how good he is. And if you can't see a thing going on in your world that you can say thank you for, think about the stuff he's done in the past because I'm guessing there's plenty. There's plenty. We're going to sing this chorus together. He is good because God is good. And can I just tell you, he's been so good to me. Thanks again for joining us for Church Online. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to connect with you. Would you email me personally at dan at hermantownchurch.com? I'd love to connect with you and pray for you and help you take some next steps in your spiritual journey. Again, I want to say thank you for your faithfulness as you head over to hermantownchurch.com slash give to partner with us in continuing our mission here at the church. And listen, I don't know what you're going to face this week, but I do know that you belong.